This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory. And this lecture will be on Wilson's theorem. So Wilson's theorem tells you what happens if you take p minus 1 factorial modulo p for p a prime. Um, well, let's start by um, looking at some examples. And um, I'm going to do it for p not necessarily prime. So let's take any number m. I'm going to take it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And let's work out m minus 1 factorial, which gives you 1, 1, 2, 6, 24, 1, 20, 7, 20, 5, 0, 4, 0, and 40320. Oh. Now let's work out what is m minus 1 factorial modulo m. And here we get 1, and here we get 1, which I'm going to write as minus 1. Um, you know, minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod 2, so that doesn't matter. And here 2 is minus 1 mod 3, and here 4 is 6 is 2 mod 4. And here we get 24 is minus 1 mod 5, and here we get 0. Here we get minus 1, here we get 0, and 0. So let's see what's going on. Well, if m is a prime, we've got these numbers here. And if we work out p minus 1 factorial, see there's a rather obvious pattern. It is always minus 1. So this gives us Wilson's theorem, which says that if p is prime, this implies p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. Um, so um, let's try checking it for p equals 11, except I'm feeling lazy, so I'm not actually going to work out um, 11 minus 1 factorial and reduce it modulo 11. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the numbers from um, 1 to 10, and I want to multiply these together. But before doing that, I'm going to try and save some work by pairing them off. So first of all, I notice I don't really need to include 2 and 6 because 2 and 6 cancel out because 2 times 6 is congruent to 1 mod, mod 11 so I can miss them out. Similarly 3 and 4 cancel out um, and 5 and 9s are 45 so 5 and 9 cancel out and then 7 8s are 56 so 7 and 8 cancel out. So all these numbers cancel out in pairs and the product is equal is congruent to 1 modulo 11. So um, 11 minus 1 factorial is congruent to 1 times 10, which are the two numbers left over, um, which is congruent to minus 1 modulo 11. Um, notice, by the way, that um, 10 and 1 sort of pair off with themselves. So 10 is its own inverse because 10 squared is congruent to 1 modulo 11. And of course, 1 squared is congruent to 1 modulo 11. So that's why these two numbers are left over. They're the numbers that are their own inverses. So let's see what's going on. So most numbers a um, pair off with a number a, a to the minus 1. And if a is not equal to minus 1, so if a is not equal to a to the minus 1, these cancel. If a is equal to a to the minus 1, then when they don't cancel out because we, can't, we don't get a factor of 10 times its inverse 10 because we've already used op 10, if you see what I mean. So, um, so a equals, so the ones that don't cancel are the ones with a congruent to a to the minus 1, which is just the same as saying a squared is congruent to 1. And this says a squared minus 1 is congruent to 0, so a minus 1 times a plus 1 is congruent to 0. And now, because p is prime, this implies a minus 1 is congruent to 0, or a plus 1 is congruent to 0. So a is congruent to plus or minus 1. Um, you remember, if a number is prime and divides the product of two numbers, then it has to divide one of them. So we can now see why Wilson's theorem is true for any prime p. So if we work at p minus 1 factorial, we get the numbers 1 times 2 up to p minus 2 times p minus 1. And all these numbers here, these pair, pair off 
as pairs a8 minus 1. Um, and these two numbers don't because p minus 1 to the minus 1 is congruent to p minus 1, and similarly for minus 1. So p minus 1 factorial is just congruent to 1 times p minus 1, which is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. Um, so um, let's see what happens if p is not prime. So, so what is m minus 1 factorial modulo m, where m is not prime? And there's a very plausible argument that m minus 1 factorial is congruent to 0 mod m. Put a question mark because this actually turns out to be false. And the argument is as follows. Suppose m is equal to a b for 1 less than or equal to a b is less than m. Um, then m minus 1 factorial includes a and b as factors, so is divisible by a times b, which is equal to m. And this is actually false. Well, it's, it's very nearly true, but it's, it, it's actually false. And, and if you go back to this thing we calculated at the beginning, you can see it's false for the number 4. So point out that m minus 1 factorial is, is actually not divisible by, by m in this particular case. And we can see what goes wrong in this case is if we take m equals 4, we can write 4 is equal to 2 times 2. But now these two factors of 2 are actually the same, so, so we, we, we can't quite deduce that, that, that m minus 1 factorial is divisible by 4. This is actually the only counterexample. And I'm just going to leave this as an exercise. Um, check that if m is not prime and m is not equal to 4, then m minus 1 factorial is congruent to 0 modulo m. Um, I mean, you might think that, that what's going wrong here is that m is a square. And you might think, well, other squares are going to give this problem. But if you, if you check them carefully, you'll find they actually don't. Um, so, so this is great because we now have a test for primes where we, 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 we can now test whether a number is prime. So we can say m is prime if and only if m minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo m. I guess we should take m greater than 1 because otherwise 1 satisfies this. Um, and this test is totally useless. The problem is that it's very difficult to work out m minus 1 factorial mod m except by first fact well, except by first checking whether m is prime or not, in which case you can just use Wilson's theorem. In general, um, you can ask the problem what is a factorial modulo m for some numbers a and m? And this seems hard to calculate um, if m is very large. You know, m might be a 100-digit prime or something. And then if, if a is reasonably large, it's very difficult to work this out. I mean, for a up to a few million or a few billion, you can work it out on a computer by multiplying them together. But if, if a and m both have hundreds of digits, then who knows? Um, um, this is a bit disappointing because some products are rather easy to work out. We saw we could work out a to the power of b modulo m very fast, even if a, b, and m are very large. This is multiplying together large copies of a. But nothing like this seems to work for finding a factorial. And it's, it's rather unlikely there is a really fast algorithm, because if there were a fast algorithm, it would be easier to check whether numbers are primes. And this is, this is quite a tricky problem. Um, so let's see some applications of Wilson's theorem. So the first application is let's find the square root of minus 1. Well, you may think the square root of minus 1 is equal to i if you do complex numbers, but we're not doing complex numbers. What we want to do is to find the square root of minus 1 modulo p. So we want to solve 
x squared is common to minus 1 modulo p. And we can't always do this. So, so if, we, if we try p equals 3, um, there's no solution, as you can easily check. Um, in general, if p is congruent to 3 modulo 4, there's again no solution. And this is easier to figure out because if x squared is congruent to minus 1 modulo p, then x to the 4 is congruent to 1 modulo p. So x has order exactly 4 because the order must divide 4 and it can't be equal to 2 by, by, this, by this equation. And since we know x to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 by Fermat, well, um, since x is order 4 and x to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1, this implies that 4 must actually divide p minus 1. So p is congruent to 1 modulo 4 if minus 1 has a square root, so p can't be 3 modulo 4. That, that's, um, I guess, if... Um, here we're, 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 we're taking p, I should have said p, let's take p to be odd because if p equals 2 then x squared equals minus 1 still has a square root. You notice that if p equals 2 this argument breaks down because minus 1 is actually equal to 1 so x actually is order 2. Um, so um, we now have the following problem. If p is congruent to 1 modulo 4 does minus 1 have a square root? Um, and let's just check a few cases. So we take p equals 5 or 13 or 17. And we notice that 2 squared is congruent to minus 1 here. Um, um, so for 13, we can try 2 doesn't work, 3 doesn't work, 4 doesn't work, 5. Ah, oh, 5 squared. Is congruent to minus 1, so that works here, and 17 is easy because that's just 16 plus 1, so 4 squared is congruent to minus 1. So the first few primes we check, minus 1 does indeed have a square root. So, so can we prove this in general? Well, th 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 there's an easy way to do this, um, because it turns out that p minus 1 over 2 factorial is a square root of minus 1 if p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. And let's see why this is true. Well, let's just take p equals 13 and see what's going on. So we write out the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, these are the numbers um, co-prime to 13 modulo 13. And um, p minus 1 factorial p minus 1 over 2 factorial is going to be the product of these numbers here. And um, we've also got these leftover numbers. And notice these numbers all pair off. So 6 is minus 7, 5 is minus 8, 4 is minus 9, 3 is minus 10, and, and so on. So, so what is p minus 1 factorial? Well, it's equal to p minus 1 over 2 factorial, which is the product of all these, times p minus 1 over 2 factorial times minus 1 to the 6, because each of these numbers is one of these six numbers times minus 1. So, so multiplying all these together, we get the product of all these numbers together with six factors of minus 1. And minus 1 to the 6 is easy to work out. This is just 1, of course. So p minus 1 factorial is uh, given by p minus 1 over 2 factorial squared. Well, we know p minus 1 factorial by Wilson's theorem. It's just minus 1. So, so minus 1 is congruent to p minus 1 over 2 factorial all squared if... Well, well, why did this work? If we have an even number of minus signs... Um, so, how many minus signs do we have here? Well, the number of minus signs is just p minus 1 over 2. So, the number of minus signs is p minus 1 over 2. So, this works if 
p minus 1 over 2 is even. And this just says p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. Um, so, um, um, to summarize, um, we see um, p, let, let's take p to be odd, um, has a square root of minus 1 if and only if p is congruent to 1 modulo 4, in which case the square root is um, p minus 1 over 2 factorial. Um, you might ask, by the way, what happens if what if um, p is congruent to 3 modulo 4? What is p minus 1 over 2 factorial? Well, the same argument as before shows that p minus 1 over 2 factorial all squared is, is it, it, it's again minus 1, this comes from Wilson's theorem, times minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2. And now this is going to be odd because p is congruent to um, 3 mod 4. So this is just congruent to, to 1. So p minus 1 over 2 factorial must be a square root of 1. So it's either congruent to plus 1 or minus 1. Um, both of these cases can occur. If we take p equals 3, we get plus 1. And if p equals 7, we get 1 times 2 times 3, which is minus 1 modulo 7. Um, um, we can also use this idea to give a, a, a proof of um, Fermat or Euler's theorem. So you remember um, the version of Fermat's theorem says that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, and Euler's generalization says that a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. And um, let's give another proof of this. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the product. Uh, let's first of all do the prom p. Let, let's take the product 1 times 2 all the way up to p minus 1 mod p. And now what I'm going to do is, is, is I'm going to change this to, I'm going to compare this with the product a times 2a times 3a all the way up to p minus 1 times a, where a is now um, co-prime to p. Well, the thing is, um, these numbers a, 2a and so on are just the same as the numbers 1 up to p up to p minus 1 in a different order. Because we just have a map from these numbers to these ones by taking um, any number n to a times n. And we can take a n back to a to the minus 1 times a n. So these two products are actually the same. Um, however, they differ by a factor. Of, well, it's pretty obvious. Um, they differ by a factor of a to the p minus 1 because you've just got p minus 1 extra copies of a in here. Well, if, if two numbers are, are, are the same and they differ by a factor of a to the p minus 1, this just means a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Um, well, we can do the same for Euler's theorem. We, we get the same proof except we multiply all numbers co-prime to m. And um, set of all numbers co-prime to m, there are just phi m of these. And um, if, if you do the same proof, you find 1 times 2 times um, m minus 1, where these, th th these are all co-prime to m. And you compare it with a times 2a and so on. And just as before, we get a one-to-one -one correspondence if a is co-prime to m, so it has an inverse. So the product of these numbers is the same as the product of these numbers. And just as before, this implies a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. Um, the same proof, uh, if, you, if you want to work with abstract group theory, the same 
proof gives a proof of Lagrange's theorem for abelian groups, but this doesn't seem to work for non-abelian groups because it depends on the order you're multiplying things in a bit. Um, so this suggests um, the following problem. Um, suppose um, M is uh, need not be prime. I mean, it might be prime, but more generally, it might not be prime. Now, now we've seen that um, M minus one factorial is not a terribly interesting number if M is not prime. Um, so that's the product of all numbers up to m minus 1. But we can ask instead, what is the product of all residue classes co-prime to m? So you, in our previous proof of, of, of Euler's theorem, in, instead of multiplying all numbers up to m minus 1, we just multiply together the ones that are co-prime to m. Well, as usual, we should start by looking at a few examples. So let's just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we write out the numbers that are co-prime to it. So here, one, three, one, two, three, four, one, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. And here we have one, three, five, seven. Let's just do nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we take the product of all these modulo m. So what do we get? Well, here we get 1, um, here we get 1, here we get minus 1. I should say that's equal to minus 1. Um, here we get um, 1 times 3 is minus 1. Here we get minus 1. Here we get minus 1. So we always seem to be getting minus 1. Here we get minus 1. Here we get Oops, here we get plus one, so we don't always get minus one. Here we get minus one. So um, this is a little bit odd because we almost had a generalization of Wilson's theorem. You see, it, um, um, you, 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 you might think that if you're taking the product of all residue classes co-prime to n, then you're going to get Wilson's theorem working, but it goes wrong for eight. And that's not a calculational error. Um, it really does go wrong for 8. So um, let's try and see why it goes wrong for 8 and what other numbers it goes wrong for. So what is the product of all residue classes modulo m that are co-prime to m. Well, just as before, we can pair off elements with their inverses. So we pair off a with a to the minus 1. And if a is not equal to a to the minus 1, the product is 1. Well, if a is equal to a to the minus 1, the product is 1, but we only have one copy of a. So we're left with all numbers a with a equals a to the minus 1. So, so the product that we're trying to work out is equal to the product over all a such that a is equal to a to the minus 1 of a. So we need to work out what this is. Um, well, um, suppose um, there's only one number there's only one number a not equal to 1 with a equals a to the minus 1. And this must, of course, be a equals minus 1, because minus 1 is equal to its own inverse. Then we get Wilson's theorem. The, 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 the product of all numbers a with a m equals 1, modulo m, is equal to minus 1 again. So we saw, for instance, that this holds for the number 6 or 9, um, because, again, for, for, for these numbers, there's only one number um, equal to its own inverse other than 1, which is minus 1. What if um, there's, there are other numbers? Well, suppose... Um, suppose a squared is congruent to minus 1 and a is not equal to plus 1 
or minus 1. Well, then we've actually got at least four numbers, so 1, minus 1, a, and minus a, are four different numbers satisfying x squared is um, congruent to 1. Um, suppose these are the only four numbers, then the product is 1 times minus 1 times a times minus a, which is now equal to 1. So if there are exactly four numbers that are square roots of minus 1, then the, 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 then the answer to our problem is 1. So this happens, for instance, for m equals 8. We can take a equals 3, and the numbers are 1, minus 1, 3, and minus 3 mod 8, and we get the product is 1 as before. Well, so that's if there are four numbers. What if there are even more? So we've got our number a. Um, so we've got a number a not equal to minus 1 with a squared congruent to 1. And we've got these numbers 1, minus 1, a, minus a. Suppose there's another number b, such that b squared is congruent to 1. Well, then we can find some other numbers that are also congruent to 1, because minus b also has this property, and so does a times b, and so does minus ab. So here the product of these is 1. What's the product of these four numbers? Well, it's um, we've got a factor of b squared, which is 1, and another factor of b squared, which is 1, and then we've got factor of minus 1 times a times minus a, which is again 1. So the product of all of these is 1. And now we see that um, all the numbers with a, that, 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 whose square is 1 split into groups of four numbers whose product is 1. There may be more of these, so there'll be d minus d and so on. So um, you, you can easily see that these collections of four numbers are all disjoint, because if b was equal to one of these numbers here, then since a and minus a and minus one of inverses, these two sets would actually be the same. So the numbers with x squared as congruent to 1 split into groups of 4, Um, this is assuming there's some number a squared congruent to 1 with a not equal to plus or minus 1, because otherwise we, if a was equal to 1 or minus 1, the product of these would be minus 1, not 1, um, with product 1. So the product over all numbers a with a squared equals 1 of a is now equal to 1, because the product of each of these groups of 4 is equal to 1. So we've now solved our problem. The product over all numbers a that are co-prime to m, modulo m of a, is equal to either 1 or minus 1. So it's equal to minus 1 if there are, um, if minus 1 is the only solution to x squared equals 1 other than 1. And it's equal to 1 if there are more than two solutions to x squared equals 1. So, so um, um, th th this, using this, we can now find other cases when the, when the product is actually equal to 1. For example, um, actually after 8, the next example is, is 15. Um, so for 15, there are, the, 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 there are now, um, so, the, the, there's more than one number whose square is 1, because 1 squared, 4 squared, 11 squared, and 14 squared are all congruent to 1 modulo 15. That's because 4, four squared is 16, and 11 is minus 4, and, and, and so on. So the product over all residue classes co-prime to 15 of a is now equal to 1, not minus 1. Um, uh, okay, that'll be all for this lecture.